This is a lecture on I.O. controllers for COMP 375, Computer Architecture and Organization at North Carolina A&T State University. Internal components for computer are the CPU, the memory, and the bus. When you write a program, if you just do calculations and change variables, these access the memory, the bus, and the CPU. But you have to read and write to I.O. devices. You read from a file, you write to the screen, or you write to a printer. Those are I.O. devices. They're external. Here's a short list of I.O. devices that I made up as I just looked around my office. You have all sorts of things. Some are built into the cabinet of the computer, like the disk. Others are obviously external, like the keyboard and the mouse. And there's all sorts of other devices out there. They run at different speeds. This chart is a logarithmic scale. So each increment larger is 10 times faster. And so you can see the gigabit ethernet is a billion bits per second. I actually believe that displays are even faster than that. And you can see hard disks. Actually, this is an old chart taken from the textbook. Uh, but down at the bottom, you can see things like the keyboard. How fast can you type anyway? Uh, so the keyboard and the mice are very slow compared to many of the other devices. They have computer mice, but no rats. You need to be fast like a gigabunny. The devices differ in several different qualities. They have different speeds, as mentioned before. Granularity. Granularity is the size of the unit that you can read and write. Keyboards can type individual characters. Disk drives generally read and write blocks of maybe 4,000 bytes. Uh, and also on how you control the devices. The IO controllers are the interface between the different devices and the internal components of the computer. Here's the usual graph I've shown many times representing the architecture of a computer. And you'll notice the I.O. controller connects to the bus and also connects to the I.O. device. Generally, I only draw one I.O. controller. Usually, there are many I.O. controllers. There's typically one I.O. controller for each type of device or each type of interface. There may be multiple devices connected to each I.O. controller. The I.O. controller is the interface between the I.O. device and the internal operations of the system, the bus, the memory, and the CPU. The CPU does not access the I.O. devices directly. Instead, it requests the I.O. controller to take actions to the I.O. devices. So the CPU sends a request to the I.O. controller, and the I.O. controller runs in parallel with the processor. I.O. controllers connect the I.O. devices to the system. You can think of an I.O. controller as plugging into the bus and then having I.O. devices plugging into the controller. It communicates with the CPU and the RAM over the bus. Most controllers can access the memory, and read and write directly from the memory, and they also get commands and return status to the CPU. A single I.O. controller may control multiple devices. Most computers have many I.O. controllers, one for each type of device or each type of interface. The CPU generally commands the I.O. controllers to take actions. The I.O. controller is responsible for several different activities. First of all, it's an interface translation. That is, the I.O. devices do not communicate in the same manner as the bus. The bus has its protocol for communicating, and the I.O. devices have their own protocols. Most of the I.O. devices have a serial connection, whereas the bus is very parallel. So there's also a difference in speed. Some of the, as you showed earlier, some of the I.O. devices are very slow. Say your mouse, uh, it doesn't send an awful lot of information to the system, whereas the bus runs very fast. Uh, and then there's addressing. You have to be able to specify an individual device. The CPU has to indicate which device it wants to read or write to.
Multiplexing is the connecting of multiple devices to the computer through the I.O. controller. In other words, you could send a command to the I.O. controller, and the I.O. controller will specify the individual device that's supposed to take that action. You can have multiple devices reading and writing simultaneously to the machine, and the I.O. controller handles the flow of data to two devices or more. Buffering is the uh, saving of information between the devices. The, the bus runs very quickly. So if the I.O. controller is going to send information out to a relatively slow device, then it will read a block of information from the memory across the bus and then feed it out to the device at a speed that the device can handle it. I.O. controllers also detect any errors the device may be able to detect and possibly correct them. In some cases, the I.O. controller will take action to retry or correct an error. In other cases, it will simply inform the CPU that an error has occurred. Controlling some devices takes multiple steps, and an I.O. controller may initiate the multiple steps. There is at least one controller for each type of device. Different devices may connect to the same controller with the same interface. Different types of devices may all plug into the computer through a USB port. You need one USB controller to connect to them. The CPU has to be able to specify which device it wants to access. It does that as if it was accessing memory. I.O. controllers have an address on the bus. They have an address that the CPU can uh, send information to by reading and writing in almost exactly the same way as it reads and writes from memory. There are basically two different I.O. addressing schemes. In one case, the I.O. addresses are completely independent of the memory addresses. The Intel processor uses this scheme. In another way, the I.O. devices overlap the memory addresses, and they have the same memory addressing space as you would to store variables. This is known as memory mapped I.O. Here's the system where you have separate address space for your I.O. devices. So you have two sets of numbers, from 0 to a big number. If you're addressing memory, you then the bus has a wire saying this is a memory access and it will access the memory and get the uh, RAM. Usually at some high address, the BIOS or a ROM overlaps that addressing. And so when the CPU addresses that high address, it's getting information from the BIOS ROM. For IO, if it specifies it wants an IO, it specifies the individual IO controller's address. So the IO controllers can have a can overlap the memory addresses. You can have you know, IO controller at address 42 and memory at address 42. They're just different address spaces. In memory mapped IO, the IO controllers and the memory uh, use the same memory space. That is, you might have a memory address at 42, but you can't have an IO controller at that. Typically, the IO controllers are at one end of the memory, often the high end. So the I.O. controllers have very large addresses. When you address an I.O. controller, there's typically three different addresses for each controller. One address is for data transfer. Uh, now, some I.O. controllers get all their information to and from the RAM, or others at least get some information directly from the CPU. So there may be a port to access data and to send data to the device. There's another port or, or address for controlling the device. You have to specify which device you want. You might in this port specify the device address, tell whether you want to read or write, or what is the operation you, the CPU wants done with the I.O. So it will send that information to the I.O. controller port. So it would write information to the controller port. It would read information from the status port. That is, it wants to know how is this device working. You can get a device status, finding out whether it's 
is it running? Is it idle? Is there an error? Is the last request you made completed already? So you can look in the status port. So these are three separate addresses, very much as if they were three separate memory addresses, three separate variables. You could write something or store something into the data transfer. You could store a control word into the control port, or you could read the status variable. Here's an example for a very simple primitive IO device uh, where we have the status. We have three addresses, the device status, the IO ready bit, which is a particular bit of the device status, and then the device data port, where you can store data. Uh, this would assume a memory mapped IO scheme. So in the first instruction, the or picking up the device status and moving it into the EAX register. We then end that register with the I already bit. And check and see if it's set. If it's not set, meaning if you end it and the result is zero, it goes back and does it again. So this program spins around, repeatedly checking the device status until it changes and the device ready bit becomes on. Now, this has the disadvantage that the computer is doing nothing else but spinning around looking for the device status. On the other hand, some machines aren't doing anything else. You can think of some very small device uh, that's checking its one and only I.O. port and it doesn't have anything to do until that device is ready. So it keeps checking. Finally, when the device is ready, it will pick up a data byte and move it into the device address for data transfer. So it would write that byte into the device. If there were multiple, if there were multiple bytes to be written, then there would be another loop around this that would pick up the next byte, and go back to check I.O. and see if the device is ready. Some I.O. controllers need to do some analysis and filtering of the data as it comes in from the I.O. device. Let's consider an Ethernet controller. Ethernet packets have a header that include an identification as to which computer is supposed to receive this message. In the Ethernet protocol, Generally, all computers receive all packets of information. If the packet is not identified for this computer, then the controller will discard it or simply not give it to the CPU. So the IO controller has to analyze the header, check to make sure that the information was received correctly. And if everything looks good, then and only then transfer it to RAM and tell the CPU that a packet was received. Some controllers have to transform the data in many ways so that it can be used by the computer system. The answer is B. Almost all devices are slower than the bus. When you're driving in the street behind a city bus, those things are slow. Computer buses have to be faster than all I.O. devices. When you want to measure the speed of an I.O. device, you can look at its latency and its throughput. The latency is how long it takes from when you first request a command to occur until when it actually starts happening. The throughput is once it starts going, how many bytes per second, or how, many, how much data can be pushed through the machine. <laughs> Some devices require multiple steps in order to make them work. Uh, others simply say, send this byte out to this device, and that's all it takes. Uh, as information comes in, the controller can detect errors and react properly to them and even attempt to recover from errors. Some controllers do not provide a lot of support for controlling the device. All they do is send the commands from the CPU to the device. Below is an example of a floppy disk controller. We don't use floppy disks much anymore, and for good reason. With this dumb controller, uh, the CPU tells this floppy drive to start spinning. The floppy drives would stop spinning when they weren't being used, so start it up. And then once it starts gets spinning at the proper speed, the I/O controller will interrupt the processor until it's running at the fast speed. Then I'll, the processor will tell the controller, move the disk read arm out to the proper location. So the controller moves the arm out to the proper location and then interrupts the CPU when the arm is in position. 
the process then tells it to start reading to transfer the data into memory. And then once the data has been transferred to memory, the disk interrupts the CPU to tell it the transfer is complete. Some controllers have embedded processors that handle a lot of the processing of the information. This offloads the work from the CPU, allowing the I.O. controller to run independently of the CPU, allowing the CPU to get more processing done. Uh, of course, each device uh, runs slightly differently, and the I.O. controllers have to be able to operate each one. This proves performance for all devices and, and processors. In this example, the processor sends a request to read to the smart I.O. controller, giving it the location on the disk that where it wants to read and the location in memory where it wants the data to be stored. The disk then does all the steps. It starts the thing spinning, moves the arm out, reads the information into memory, and then when it's all done, it will interrupt the CPU to tell it that the operation is complete or that an error has occurred. Most high-speed I.O. controllers use direct memory access, or DMA. Uh, it allows high-speed movement of data between the I.O. controller and the uh, memory. Some devices do bit buffer chaining. That is, instead of specifying an individual memory address for where data is to be stored, they can give blocks of memory address put some of the information here, and then some of the information in another location, and the rest of the information in a third location. Uh, so in this example, we have a linked list of addresses. You give the linked list to the I.O. controller, which then puts the first so many bytes read into the data buffer one, the next so many bytes, depending on how much is specified, into buffer two, and the remainder into buffer three putting the data into different areas in memory. Uh, so this would be often called a scatter read, or if you're writing from multiple buffers, a gather write. Uh, it's particularly useful uh, if you have operating system information and user data that has to both be sent out to the IO device. For instance, if you have a network packet, the Network header may be created by the operating system, whereas the data to be sent comes from the user address space. You can do I.O. buffer chaining so that you write some of it from an I.O. buffer in the operating system that specifies the header, and then the rest of it from the user data space where the data is taken. Some computers go beyond just chaining the data and chain a series of I.O. commands. Uh, in this way, there's a linked list of I.O. commands, each specifying what operation should be done, the address of memory, the address of the device, and how much should be read or written. And these are chained together. So the processor gives the head of the list to the I.O. controller and tells the I.O. controller to start a command. While the I.O. controller is going down the linked list, doing the commands, reading and writing the information, it is possible for the CPU to add more uh, commands on the end of the list so that it just keeps on going and the I.O. controller just keeps reading and writing devices and the CPU keeps giving it more and more to do. This, of course, improves uh, the efficiency of all devices. Watch out for homework that's going to be posted on Blackboard in the near future. It will be due next week.